All right. <clears throat> First, let's take a look at the definition. And I use the term explosive plyometrics, like Yosef alluded to this a little bit, to distinguish it from just plyometrics. Today, we hear plyometrics being used all the time. You pick up a magazine, everybody's doing plyometrics. Nobody does jumps anymore. Everybody does plyometrics. It's the buzzword. It's the trendy term. So if you want to sound like you really know what you're doing, you're a top-notch trainer, I do plyometrics. Sounds good. But what does it mean? If we talk about an explosive plyometrics, and this is what Vereshansky, who we say is the father of plyometrics, but really who uh, developed no, he says what we do in the United States is don't, don't call me the father. I'm not the father of plyometrics. He's the father of the depth jump. That's what he was going for, the shock method. That's what he considered plyometrics. But we have bastardized the term and changed it around to every little jump became plyometrics. But for, a ply for an exercise to be plyometric, it has to be executed between 1,500th to 2,000th of a second. It's fast. And volitionally, we can hardly even come close to doing this. It's very hard for us to duplicate, execute in action this quick. So, and where does this number come from? This is how what we see in many, in execution of many sports skills. In sprinting, the foot's in contact with the ground for a world-class sprinter, all of one-tenth of a second and less. Like Bolt and a few other people, it's less than a tenth of a second. That means less than five hundredths of a second is for the touchdown and less than five hundredths of a second for the push-off. That's fast. But if I'm going to do, am I duplicating that speed? I'm slow as molasses on that move. But yeah, we call this plyometrics. A world of difference. So that's why I say explosive plyometrics. Get away, I'm getting away from the term of plyometrics. And whenever I hear the term plyometrics, you want to use plyometrics? Hey, that's good. You use it as preparation for explosive plyometrics. It's a prelude. It's a build-up to it. But it is not plyometrics. Jump training. Jump training is very effective. This is one thing I, I see a lot, especially in, a, in the uh, Russian literature. They distinguish plyometric training, jump training. These are two different categories, and they use them for different times. For example, a volleyball player, basketball player, many times they have to do repeated jumps up and down. They have to continue them. They don't just do one and that's it. Sometimes that's, that's all it is. So if they're going to be doing, uh, let's say even in the training, like uh, when I worked with the U.S. Volleyball, they would do um, 30, 40, 50 jumps at a time. This was jump training. This was to develop the jump endurance. I can use that term. We, we did many repetitions. This is jump training has nothing to do with plyometrics. Don't even associate the two. It's a completely different category. Or any kind of jump like that where you're just doing repetitive jumps where speed is not of the consequence. Just height where you're trying to execute a maximum jump. Okay, next slide, Alex. Okay, Vereshansky, as I mentioned, is the originator of plyometrics as we know it. But as I said, he was more concerned with the depth jump. This was what he considered plyometrics. So when he was talking about plyometrics, 
It was the shock method. And in the shock method, how many of you are familiar or heard this term before? <coughs> familiar with it? Okay, most of you are. Well, let me kind of, you know, just go over it, maybe not go into too much detail. The key to plyometrics is from a jump down, let me change that term, not a jump down, from a drop down. You don't jump down. But as you're coming down, when you hit, it's a shock to the body. And then the muscles will volitionally, automatically contract. The faster they contract, and the more intensely they contract, the less you're going to go down. The slower and easier they contract, the further you're going to go down. The further you go down, the more time you're taking, the slower the total movement. The more you can withstand the forces and have a very powerful contraction, eccentric contraction, then that's going to stop the down. And you're going to create, in this eccentric contraction, a tremendous amount of tension, built-in force, that you can then use on the return. But the more you go down, the more you lose it. And you're not going to have that power to return. So it's a very forced, volitional contraction. And the stronger you can get that forced reaction, the more powerful will be the return jump. So this was the shock. <clears throat> but you can't go crazy with the height of the, of the jump down or the drop down. The heights get too high. Uh, psychologically, it wears on the athlete. The Russians have found if they had the athletes jumping from nine feet or more, they didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> too high. Psychologically, that was not good. Uh, and then, then, when the height got too high, just drop down and hold. That's kind of a unique concept. But this is another training, and in the United States we call this the altitude jump, uh, where you drop down and hold. It's a great exercise to develop that eccentric strength to stop you from going all the way down. Now, this type of strength is also very important in many sports. Could you think of another example where you would see or need this type of reaction? <clears throat>